أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين verse number 93 حتى إذا بلغ بين السدين وجد من دونهما قوما لا يكادون يفقهون قولا until he reached a place between the two barriers. He found between them a people who could hardly understand a word. Now, here is the continuation of the story of Dhul Qarnain. Three incidents or three major events in his excursions around the world are mentioned here in this surah. Certainly, of course, not everything in his life is mentioned here. Uh, the one, uh, the first one mentioned was when he went towards the west and he actually quelled a rebellion there. And there were people, there were mixed people, good and evil in, in, in that society or in the community who had made the rebellion. And he actually put, brought peace to the area. Then he traveled to the east and there the, there were people who didn't have any shelter from the sun. That means they were savages. However, they were making troubles as well. Then he continued his travels until he came between the two Bayina Saddain. Sad means barrier, but of course here it means a natural barrier which are ranges, ranges of mountains. So there were two ranges of mountains which were somehow creating a natural barrier between this, these people and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. However, there was uh, uh, a valley between these two, which was uh, a sort of gateway for Yajuj and Majuj to come and attack the people who were on this side. So he, he reached there. He found between them or near to them. Not between, between is not, of course, exactly uh, where these people lived just close to the other side where Yajuj and Majuj were attacking, uh, there, there lived a people who hardly understood the words. It means that they, they were civilizations not very much developed and could not understand very sophisticated issues. La may have two meanings. One meaning is that their language was very difficult or very sort of undeveloped. And therefore, it was very difficult for Zul Qarnain to communicate with them, very difficult. And uh, hardly they could uh, convey what they wanted to say to Zul Qarnain, or hardly Zul Qarnain could talk to them. The other meaning which is preferred by uh, Al-Mizan, Allama Taba Taba, is that their civilization was so simple. And therefore, the warfare, they were quite defenseless people there. And that's why they were very vulnerable to Ya'juj and Majuj. And uh, they could not understand sophisticated things. They didn't have any technology. They didn't have any, any science. This is the meaning of la yakaduna yafqahuna qawla. They couldn't understand, uh, hardly could understand the word. Uh, now, of course, they had heard about Dhul Qarnain, the just king. The just king who traveled around the world and would fight against the oppressors and would bring peace for the oppressed people. So they uh, went to him. Of course, he was just passing by by his army. It was not his destination. He was just passing by by his army. And then hearing about his, uh, of course, fame and reputation in establishing justice, they went to him. And they offered to pay him tribute, to pay him large sums of whatever they had. Of course, they, although they were very under, underdeveloped civilization, however, apparently they had lots of wealth, uh, whatever it was. So they said, "Qalu ya dal qarnain, inna ya ajuja wa maajuj mufsidun fi al arz, fahal najalu laka kharjan ala an tajala bainana wa bainahum sada." They said. Indeed, Gog and Magog, or Ya'juj and Majuj, are causing corruption in the land. So, shall we pay you 
on condition that you build a barrier between them and us. Now, first of all, uh, these people knew that Dhul Qarnain can, can do with the technology that he knew could do miracles. I mean, could build such a bar barrier that could not be broken through by Ajuj and Majuj, and they were ready to give him whatever he wanted. Even all the wealth they had, they were ready to give him because these people, Ajuj and Majuj, were ruthless people and they would not leave them alone. Now, uh, what they said is, first of all, as I said, they had heard about the fame and reputation of Dhul Qarnain and what sort of king he was. They were not afraid of him while he was passing with his great army. They were not afraid of him. They knew that he is not going to harm them. And secondly, this meaning of mufsiduna fil ard, we have this uh, technical term of fasad fil ard in the Quran, which corruption means killing, bloodshed, uh, uh, armed robbery. These are the types of uh, corruption which could be uh, these are the types of things which could be categorized as corruption on the earth. Innama, we have in Surah Ma'idah, Innama jaza'u al-lazina yuharibun allaha wa rasoolahu wa yabghuna fil ard fasada or the other thing. Wa? Wa? Wa yufsiduna fil ard. Wa yuqattalu aw yusallabu. So this fasada fil ard is armed corruption, killing, as I said, killing, stealing, shedding blood, this is fasad of Allah. So this inna ya'juja wa ma'juj mufsidun of Allah means they come here now and again. They kill us, they take us as slaves, they take our property. So what we are ready to do is to give you whatever you want. Naj'alullaka kharja means you tell, you, you say how much. You want, we give you. So you build a barrier, a dam between these two mountains, between these two, 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 two ranges, so that uh, they could not uh, come again and uh, uh, cause corruption. He said, what my Lord has furnished me is better than what you are going to give me. Well, compared to what Zul Qarnain had, whatever these underdeveloped people had was quite uh, insignificant. So he said, I don't want money from you, and I will do that for you. You, you can see now the amount of the, the extent of his benevolence, that he was ready to stop there with all his army and to... Uh, build this huge dam between the two ranges for them so that stop the Ajuj and Majuj to come and attack them. This is exactly the same as what Suleiman said to the messengers of the Queen Sheba when she sent uh, gifts for them, for, for him to somehow appease him or uh, test him. This is what he wanted to do. Uh, Test him. قال أتمدونني بمال فما أعطاني الله خير مما أعطاكم. Are you offering me money? Whatever God is given to me is much bigger than whatever is given to you. Here, of course, Zulkarnay says the same thing. God has given me so much that I don't need your money, but I need your manpower. I don't have enough manpower to for this huge. Uh, work help me with some power this is manpower you bring the material that I need I tell you where to find it what to bring you help me with your manpower I will make a bulwark between you and them it is much uh, uh, beyond what you can imagine, something that it could never be broken through and could never be somehow climbed upon uh, so that they could come here. And uh, what he did actually, he made a dam of, uh, from iron, from iron and copper, something which of course these people neither had the technology nor had the knowledge to do, they could have brought 
stones, rocks to uh, to create a barrier. However, that was very easy for Yajuj and Madhuj to break through, to, to destroy. So he said something that they cannot break through. Atuni Zobar al-Hadid, bring me pieces of iron. Now, of course, where these pieces of iron had come, certainly it, there, there were mines close by that they could bring them, and Zulqarnain could actually refine the, 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 the iron from the, uh, the, the mines. Hatta ida sawa bayna sadafain, until when he leveled between the two flanks. So they put iron rocks or uh, refined iron up until the top of the ranges so that it was leveled with the top of the range. He said, now blow. It means he wanted to melt the iron in a way to, to put molten, molten copper on it so that it becomes a very, very strong barrier. It could not be filtered through. So when he turned it into fire, Hatta Ida Jalahu Naran Kala Atuni Ofreg Alayhe Ketra. Now bring me molten copper to pour over it. Now, of course, what he says, bring me this, bring me that, apparently he had actually the technology, he had made all these things, and they were only helping him with the manpower to, uh, to, to, to prepare these things or to, to bring these things, these things for him. Famas Ta'u and Yadharu. They could neither scale it or break through it, sorry, climb over it, yazharu, to climb over, nor they could make a hole in it. They tried a lot, apparently, Yajuj and Majuj, they tried a lot. Now you may say, while Dhul Qarnain was doing all these things, why Yajuj and Majuj did not attack him? Because, of course, they were afraid of him. No one could stand against the power of Zulqarnain, as that's, and that's why I said he was passing by his army. If he was alone, of course, they could attack him and destroy him. So he was passing by his army. His army was very strong, and therefore they could not attack him while he was preparing this dam, this huge barrier there. And after he left, of course, they tried a lot to climb over it. They climbed to break through it, but they couldn't do that. They couldn't make a hole in it. Now, this is very interesting. You see, he had all that technology, all that knowledge, all that power to create such a thing which even if we want to do today, it needs lots of technology and lots of resources if we want to create such a huge barrier or dam between two ranges, and we don't know how huge that valley was between the, uh, that gorge was between the two ranges. So after doing all this, instead of becoming arrogant and instead of saying, look what I have done, this is my power, this is my uh, uh, resources, this is a mercy from my Lord. Now, it, it was a mercy on him to give him that knowledge, that power, a mercy on those underdeveloped people who were now saved from the attacks of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And as I said, you see, this man was a, a godly man. This man was calling people to God. However, when he arrives in a place where these people, certainly they didn't have his religion. Certainly they didn't have that type of knowledge about faith, religion, and such things. He stopped there. He helped them. This is actually the humanitarian aspect of his mission. And we see that human beings who are created by God, if they are oppressed, if they are uh, subject to wrongdoings, it is the duty of everyone to help. Now, of course, whether later on they want to believe, they don't want to believe, that's a different issue. As long as they are not attacking uh, others, as long as they are not... Uh, making corruption on the earth, if they are oppressed, it is the duty. And this is what Zul Qarnain was doing. And this is what the core of this story is telling us. Zul Qarnain traveling east, west, here between the two barriers, he was just helping the weak, the 
the oppressed and not asking about what faith you have. And these people certainly, because they, they couldn't communicate even with Dulqarnain, they had a very probably simple religion, simple faith uh, in God, if any. So uh, here he says, This is the mercy of God on, on those people, of course, who kept them from uh, being attacked by Ajuj and Majud. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ رَبِّي When the promise of my Lord comes, جَعَلَهُ دَكَا When the promise of my Lord comes, he would make it, uh, he would destroy it. دَكَا Now I, I tell you what the meaning of دَكَا is. وَكَانَ وَعَدُ رَبِّي حَقَّ And of course the promise of my Lord is uh, حَق. Now دَكَا uh, from dak, dak means to pound, to, to, to pound, to become into powder or small particles. One meaning is that this would just be like a small particles. Allah will pound it in a way that nothing of it would remain. The other meaning, sorry? Destroy. Yeah, destroy it. The other meaning is that it would make it uh, vulnerable to... Uh, to be climbed upon, it would make it would make it irrelevant. Actually, Dakka means zalil, means uh, uh, insignificant. This would become insignificant, uh, and that's why some people say that when technology would improve, then Yajuj and Majuj could use the technology to fly over this dam. That's one meaning of it. So Jalahu Dakka. The other meaning is that it would decay, decay Dakka also from. Uh, uh, to become layena, to, to decay and uh, become rusty and then uh, uh, is uh, torn apart from each other. This is the other meaning of the kaja'ala or dakka. Now, depending what this wa'adu rabbi is, when actually, uh, about what time uh, Zulqarnain is talking about, whether he's talking about the promise about the day of judgment, if he's talking about the promise of the day of judgment, Jahalu Dakam is like he puts everything on the earth. Uh, uh, the, the, the earth will be pounded and will become like powder, everything, and this, of course, would be the same thing. This is one meaning of it. The other meaning is that Wa'du Rabbi does not refer to the Day of Judgment. It refers to when Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj are let loose. And then, of course, it either becomes irrelevant, insignificant, or it would, uh, it would be somehow surmountable by them. Now, depending what uh, we, uh, we take that, it, it it gives different meanings. However, of course, this is a very, very complicated issue we have to discuss in details. Uh, that's what, what this ma'ad is and how Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj can actually surmount and who they are. Now, before talking about that, let's uh, have a historical and uh, uh, historical uh, investigation and also a look into the narrations and traditions about what uh, is said on Dhul Qarnayn, and then we come to Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj, and this, of course, promise of God. What is that promise of God which would make this dam or this barrier irrelevant or decayed or whatever it means? Now, uh, about Dhul Qarnayn, uh, we don't have anything actually in history. Anything in history is talking about Dhul Qarnayn or talking about Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj. We have some references in the Bible to, uh, to Jomer and Ma'ajuj, who were the sons of Yafith, of the sons of, son of one of the sons of Nuh. Uh, Yafith, he, his sons, when uh, the Bible mentions his sons, uh, he says that uh, from Yafith, came Jomer and Majuj and Madai and Bawan and Nubal and, and others. So there are references in other places as well, to, to, especially to Majuj. And uh, uh, they are called in, as Gog and Magog. Uh, I will talk about that later. But about Zulqarnayn, as I said, we don't have anything in history. 
And about Yaju yeah, Jarmaju, we don't have any history, anything history, only in the Bible. Now, because we don't have anything in history, there is a sort of diverse range of opinions about who Zulqarnain was, and these are all just guesses. We really don't know, and the Quran doesn't want to tell us about him. Unless if those people who ask about Dhulqarnain, Wayasalunaka and Dhulqarnain, they ask you about Dhulqarnain, they probably knew to whom they were referring, and they wanted to know the opinion of the Prophet about him. And because the Jews asked the question, or the Jews posed the question, or uh, indirectly, they, they posed through the Mushrikun, uh, they wanted to probably uh, extract some words out of Prophet's mouth to oppose him because apparently Zorqarnain was a, was a holy person for the Jews. So based on that, then we can somehow judge between these uh, different opinions on Zorqarnain. Now, I mentioned a few of these uh, speculations about Zorqarnain. One is... Alusi, uh, of course, the great uh, Sunni exeget in his famous book, Ruh al-Ma'ani, he says he was a Persian king, Faraidun, who was uh, a grandson of Jamshid, the, the very, very famous Iranian or probably mythical king. And uh, he, uh, he actually conquered the whole world, the whole world, and then... Uh, divided into three parts and gave one to his son, Iraj. Uh, that was the, the Iraq and India and Hejaz he gave to him. And the other part he gave to his other son, Sam, and the other part he gave to his another son. And uh, then he made rules for them, how to rule these countries. And these rules were called Seisa, Seisa, three rules, and the word siyasa in Arabic comes from this. Siyasa is politics. Siyasa, that was the, uh, that is what Alusi says. Now, of course, there is no proof whatsoever, and even the history does not prove that there was such a king in Persia. It's a mythical sort of king rather than, and never we have anything in history that any Persian king had ever conquered the whole world. That is, uh, Another mythical thing. Now, the other uh, very famous uh, uh, speculation about Zulqarnain is the Alex Alexander the Great. Now, uh, there is a confusion here because, again, the, the Exodus says that we had two Alexanders. One was the Alexander the Great, the Macedonian uh, king who conquered many areas and conquered Persia and Egypt and other areas. Uh, who, whose minister was Aristotle. And this is something which many exes have leaned to. And in many Persian poets, you have this Alexander the Great to be, to be referred to as Dhul Qarnayn. And Fakhreddin Razi in his tafsir supports this idea very strongly that yes, this was Alexander the Great. Now, what we know about Alexander the Great is that he was a ruthless conqueror. And what he did in the world was just bloodshed to expand his rule. And we know he died as a, at, at a very young age. And he was, a, uh, he was not a man of God. Certainly, Alexander the Great, he was not a man of God. So mentioning him as Zulqarnain is very um, uh, surprising. I mean, the, the least thing we can say is that it's surprising. Now... Ibn Kathir says, yes, it's Alexander, but we have two Alexanders. We have a Macedonian Alexander, and we have a Roman Alexander. The Roman Alexander was a good man. He lived about 2,000 years before Jesus, and his minister was Khazr. And they have these stories that Khazr uh, uh, and Zulqarnain were actually searching for the, uh, for the, 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 the spring of life. The, the, the water which they could drink, and they become eternal, they never die. And Khazr was a minister of uh, Alexander I, the, the Roman Alexander, and when they were moving, 
Khazr uh, actually found the spring and drank from it, but then they lost it and Khazr uh, uh, Zulqarnain or Alexander could not drink from it. Now, of course, these, these are very, very funny stories that are mentioned in the tradition. I, I, I will deal with traditions later on. But historically, Ibn Kassi says he is Alexander, the Roman Alexander, who was actually with Khazr. And uh, uh, again, there is nothing to, to, to support this idea, nothing whatsoever to support the idea. Ibn Hisham, in his Sirah, he says that uh, he was uh, one of the kings of Tubba. Uh, Tubba was just like Pharaoh was a title for the kings of Egypt. Tubba was a title for the kings of Yemen. And uh, in the Quran, of course, Waqawm Tubba are mentioned, the people of Tubba, the kings who were uh, ruling in Yemen. But I mentioned before that, uh, and it's mentioned in the history, in, in, in literature, that kings of Yemen were generally called Zulqarnain. So to, to, to bring this as a, a, a sort of uh, proof for the uh, identity of Zulqarnain here is not right, because that was just a coincidence in naming rather than something which happened in the history. Now, the other thing which uh, is mentioned by Abul Kalam, Abul Kalam Azad, the, the Indian, uh, scholar, and is supported uh, with many different uh, evidence by Allama Taba Taba in Al-Mizan is that he was Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, whom, of course, the Jews had great sensitivity about him. He was a holy man for the Jews. And if we say that he was Cyrus the Grand, if we say that he was one of these people, why the Jews should ask about him at all? And what was the relevance of these people to the Jews? So, but Cyrus was someone who, of course, uh, uh, had saved the Jews from, uh, fr fr from destruction. He had helped them to rebuild the temple. And he had done lots of good. And he was a just king. We know that. Cyrus the Great was a just king, and whatever the history records from him is that his, his justice. So uh, he says that uh, what historical evidence tells us about the excursions and conquests of Cyrus, going to the west and then going to the east, to, 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 to Bacteria or Balkh, and uh, uh, putting off some rebellion there, and then building a dam in Daryal, which was very famous, I don't know whether it's there or not, all these would tell us that uh, Cyrus the Great is the, probably the most uh, uh, probable candidate historically to, uh, to be called Zulqarnain. However, as I said, all these are speculations. The speculation about Cyrus is more probable because, as I said, the Jews had sensitivities about him. The Jews, of course, regarded him as a holy man. And they wanted, actually, because the prophet was against kings and such things, against powers uh, who were ruling without a, a, a holy mandate. So they wanted to ask the prophet about this man and to know what he says. Uh, uh, so it's probable that uh, Cyrus is the best candidate. Anyhow, as I said, all these are speculations. And there is uh, no uh, firm evidence to prove anything. So eventually we, we don't know who Zulqarnain was. If we don't know who Zulqarnain was, why the story is mentioned in the Quran? Why the Prophet was asked, as I said, why the Prophet was asked is a different issue, because probably those who asked knew who Zulqarnain was, and Prophet knew who they were uh, referring to. However, as I said, the Quran is not concerned about individuals. The Quran is concerned about what is done by individuals. The Quran is concerned about the behavior, the attitudes. And therefore, without referring to his name, Zulqarnain, uh, uh, who Zulqarnain was, just by this title, 
it says that he, of course, was a just man. He was traveling for the sake of God. And he was helping the oppressed. He was helping the weak. That is Zul Qarnayn. I'm not concerned about the name or about the uh, special uh, characteristics of, of Zul Qarnayn. One other issue which uh, uh, Allama Tabatabai brings as evidence for Zul Qarnayn being Cyrus the Great is that uh, in the uh, in the uh, ancient sites where uh, sort of sculptures or uh, uh, paintings of Zulkarnay are found on the walls, he is actually uh, depicted as a man with a uh, with a helmet which has two horns, one horn leaning towards front, one horn leaning towards back, and that is why he was called Zul Qarnayn. And even in the book of Daniel, when Daniel uh, actually has that uh, uh, apparition or, uh, uh, or, or vision about someone who comes and helps the, the Jews, he sees a ram with two horns, which again, uh, is, is referring to Cyrus and is referring to Dhul Qarnayn. These are the things which are mentioned as supporting. Now, let's come to traditions. I, I am sure and I bet you never want to read these narrations to find out who Dhul Qarnayn was because they are very, uh, they have lots of conf conflicting accounts, many mythical things which have been added mostly have come from uh, Jewish converts from Wahhab ibn Munabbih and Ka'b al-Ahbar who had their own stories about Dhul Qarnayn and have mentioned it uh, in, in narrations. They have actually come into Shi'i narrations as well because most of these mythical things that we have in Sunni narrations, we have in Shi'i narrations too. And that's very strange because, of course, the Sunni narrations many of them do not go to the prophet, goes to the companions or to the tabi'un, the successors. And we say that, okay, these were their opinions, especially if it goes to Jew converts who had these stories previously, uh, as I said, like Abu Ahbar and Wahhab ibn Munabbi. However, how we find it in Shia narrations is, is amazing. But one thing which gives us, us a clue is that many a time Shia reporters confused between traditions, whether it was from Aimma or it was from companions through or through the companions to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and therefore they misplaced these traditions. Uh, there is one hadith, uh, it's a very, very important actually uh, uh, narration from Ibn Abi Umair, who is a very, very well known Shia traditionist. Some people said that you only report hadith from Ahlul Bayt. Why don't you have to report hadith through the companions, through your chains, through the companions, through the prophet? Of course, he was a narrator. He had his own chain through the companions to the prophet and his own chains to Ahlul Bayt, He said that, they said, of course, you are capable to do that. And usually the muhaddithun would like to, to to diversify their chains and to, to report from everyone, especially if it goes to, to the Prophet peace be upon him. He said that I uh, saw in, uh, in many instances that my reporters, those who report from me, they confuse between what I report from the Prophet through the companions and from what I report from Ahlul Bayt through my chains. They confuse between them, and then they attribute what I report from the Prophet to Ahlul Bayt And therefore, I have decided not to report this anymore to stop this confusion to happen. And that's why we see that many of these stories, which are really stories, mythical things, which we may say that they have come from the companions or Tabi'un learning it from other books on other mythical things, then it was wrongly attributed to the prophet later on. We see most of them in our own traditions too, and this is because of this confusion. Now, let's see what we have in traditions. 
Uh, first of all, in the very person of Dhul Qarnain, who he was, now, some traditions say that he was a human being. Some traditions say that he was an angel coming from the heaven and in the form of a human being. And some traditions say that he was actually uh, a hybrid. Uh, his father was an angel and his mother was a human being. Now, you know that, how funny these, these accounts are. And because they come in our traditions, it doesn't mean that we have to accept them. They are opposed by many, many other accounts, traditions, uh, uh, and rational understanding of the book. Uh, the, other, uh, the other conflicting accounts in traditions is that in many of the traditions we have that he was a righteous person. And he loved God, and God loved him, and meant good for him. And he meant good for God, and God meant good for him. And this is what we see in the story of the Quran. He means good for God, he means good for his people, and God meant for him, gave him all means. He put all means at his disposal. Some traditions say that he was a prophet. Some prophets' traditions say that he was a muhaddath. Like muhaddath is like the, the position of Aim Ali Musalam, that they are muhaddath, they are talked to by angels without being prophets. And about his name also, we have uh, a different sets of names in, in traditions, uh, which are different from those speculations of the Exodus. Some traditions say that his name was Ayash, the others say his name of Alexander Iskandar. Others say he was Marzbeh, a, a Greek uh, sort of king. Others say his name was Mus'ab ibn Abdullah from Qahtani Arabs. The others say he was one of the Tubba, Sa'ab ibn the Mara'id. And the others say that he was Abdullah ibn Zahak. I mean, you can just go and count what traditions say about his name. And other traditions, uh, there, there are conflicting accounts in traditions. Why was he called Dhul Qarnain? Now, in some traditions say that uh, because he called his people to God and they uh, did strike him with sword on his, the right hand side of his, uh, of his forehead, and so he just left them, and he, it was healed. He came back, he called them again, and they struck him on the uh, left hand. And that is why he was called Zul Qarnain, having two strikes on his head. And then he, he returned again, and God gave him the east and the west of the, of, of the earth. The other traditions say that he was killed once by his people by that strike, and then God revived him again. He was killed again, God revived him again, and the third time he gave him all the means, and uh, so he was called Zul Qarnain. Other traditions say that uh, uh, of those strikes, in the, in, the, in the place of those strikes, two horns came out of his head, and he had actually two horns. He had naturally, biologically, two horns. And uh, because of what uh, his people did to him, God gave him the power of, over darkness and light. So he would decide with his horns uh, whether he should give darkness to a nation or uh, light to, to a nation. Anyhow, this is what is mentioned. Uh, there's very uh, uh, entertaining tradition here that I want to mention for you. That he, originally he was born with two horns. And uh, he had these horns until he became king. And he was actually concealing these horns with his amama. So no one ever knew that he had horns. And uh, uh, he was concealing this. The only person who knew about it was his scribe, who wrote his letters here and there. And he told him, if anyone hears, if I hear that anyone has uh, 
known about my horns, I will kill you, because you are the only one who know. No one else knows. So this scribe, of course, was uh, holding himself or uh, refraining from telling this to anyone, but he could not actually bear this secret for himself. He wanted to tell to someone, but he couldn't tell to anyone. So one day he went to the wilderness, and he put his mouth on the earth and shouted, Beware, king has two horns. So he actually emptied himself. He relieved himself of this secret. And then, uh, incidentally, from that his sound reverberated in the earth and two reeds came out, or a reed came out, was, was sprouted out of the earth. And this reed grew, and one shepherd was passing by. He liked this reed and caught it and made a flute out of it. And when he went, he, whenever he blew into it, it says, beware, king has two horns. And in this way, all people realized that the king has two horns. And Zulqarnain called his scribe and said, I will kill you because you have told everyone that I have horns. And he said, no, I didn't do that. And when he found out what had happened, then he said, OK, this is what God has wanted. Anyhow, there are many other uh, uh, stories about this Dol Karnein and why he had two, uh, two horns. Why I mention these? Because we have to know that for tafsir of the Quran, especially in these issues, we cannot rely very much on traditions. And uh, if, for example, we go to Tabari, which is a sort of uh, tafsir based on narrations, or to Ad-Dur al-Mansur, we, we are really confused with, with these traditions, which we don't know the, 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 the source, the provenance of these traditions. And uh, there are many other uh, conflicting accounts about where was the place of the, of the dam he built, how long he ruled, uh, who were Ya'juj and Majuj? About Ya'juj and Majuj, inshallah, I will, I will talk next week because this is a very, very important issue and one of the uh, sort of enigmas in the Quran, and especially because it is uh, mixed or it is linked with a promise of God, Ya'juj and Majuj. Inshallah, I will talk about them next week. There are many other conflicting uh, issues in traditions. I think uh, we don't waste time talking about them. In conclusion, we don't know who Dhul Garnain was. The strongest guess is that he was Cyrus the Great. There are evidence which uh, would lead us to this, that he was Cyrus the Great, the savior of the Jews, the one who helped the Jews to rebuild the temple. And although he was not a Jew himself, it shows that he was a godly man. He cared about temples. He cared about the, the worship of God. And therefore, he may be the strongest guess was sallallahu ala muhammad wa ala tahir thank you much indeed uh, sheikh <laughs> we had some historical background um inshallah we now open some uh, floor for discussion for 10 15 minutes um, so have you got any volunteers to start with Anybody? yes uh, okay, can you pass the mic to um in the front of the place, thank you. Um, are we talking about Yajuj and Majuj this week or next week? No, next week, inshallah. Okay. Next week, yes. Actually, any, any because that is a, a, very, a more interesting topic to, to deal with, yes. Uh, any sisters? No? Uh, doctor? In I, I think Yajuj and Majuj been mentioned twice in Quran. Yes. But is uh, the Qur'an mentioned only once? Yes. The Qur'an is mentioned only in this surah, but Yajuj and Majuj are mentioned here and Surah Anbiya. Yeah. Therefore, might not be the Magul. Uh, well, I will talk about both places next week, inshallah, to see what, 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 what that may mean, inshallah. Any, any sisters? Any sisters? No, anybody from the brother side? No? Yeah? And the adjustment can Thank you. Yes. 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, you mentioned that uh, when uh, Sulkarnain he went to these people and they offered him the wealth and everything, and his reply was uh, something like this: that he has got uh, what God has given to him is more than what they can offer. And uh, the other thing is, uh, with many ambias, it is mentioned in different places that. Uh, they uh, guide you, but they are not asking for any reward for it. In different places it is mentioned. So this is similar sort of tone, that uh, he doesn't want the reward from anybody else. Whatever God has given him is sufficient for him in a way. <coughs> uh, uh, well, we? here it, there is no uh, reference to guidance. Yes. If he was a prophet, which we don't know whether he was a prophet or not, and uh, most of our traditions say that he was not a prophet. He was a muhaddath. And uh, we have in one of the traditions that Amir uh, al uh, salam is reported from him through Imam al-Baghir or Imam al-Sadiq I'm not sure now, that uh, he says that when the prophet mentioned the story of Zulqarnain, said, وَفِيكُمْ مِثْلُهُ And there is someone like him among you. And he was referring to Ali, peace be upon him, that he was someone, he was a muhaddath, just like Zulqarnain was a muhaddath and God was communicating with him. However, even if he was a prophet, here he is not asking anything for guidance. They are actually asking him to do work for them. And that work, of they were commissioning him to do some work. Just like the gifts which uh, were offered to Suleiman, it was offered to them as a tribute for peace, so to speak. So this is not something which is related to guidance at all. Now, here, both in this place and in the story of Suleiman, what we understand is that they were unlike the kings who are greedy. You know, people, even if they have the whole world, they want more. The more they have, they want more. This is the greed. Now, if someone offers something to someone else, something of course, considerable, significant. And if they refuse it, we know that they have no greed. And this shows that Zulqarnain had no greed for, for, for this world, and actually he spent his energy, his time, to help these people. So it was not for guidance, certainly. Okay. Any sisters? Any brothers? Yeah? Really? That's me. Just... Thank you very much. I'm sorry to ask again uh, the same question. But uh, I think the earlier story, by, I mean, uh, reading of it, is uh, it was like somebody investigating the, the truth from going to, from the east to west and, and developing actually belief in God or the goodness as his process. Am I right? Or was he from convinced from the beginning of in, in God. I haven't read this anywhere, actually. I don't know what is the source of this he was investigating to find. Why would it make him really coming from west to go to the east? Where yeah, he, he was a king, and he wanted to help and to uh, fight against corrupt nations. And that's why, for example, he went to the west, uh, when he went there, you see the whole the whole tone is قُلْ فِيهِمْ حُسْنَ قَالَ أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّي فَيُعَذِّبُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ so, so this this is the word of not a some suspicious person or someone who is in doubt. This is the word of someone who is acting on command of God. So, uh, I don't know, where have you read this, or where have you heard this? I, I can't remember, but I think it was, uh, as he goes from, uh, as he's investigating, or you getting, to, you want to get to the truth when he goes to the, to the west, then he finds he has to go to the east to find the truth. Well, the way of the tone, we told him, means that he had some communication. As we said last week, this communication may mean he was either a prophet or he was accompanied by a prophet or he was a muhaddath. 
just like our Ayyam Ali Musa, who were Muhandas. So he was one of these three. So he cannot be in doubt because no one can reach this, this attitude, the, 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 this, this altitude or this height, uh, unless they, they have great uh, ground in faith. Thank you. Any sisters? Brothers? Um, Sheikh, towards the end, uh, you touched a very good point there when you said that to do the tafsir of Quran, we cannot rely on all these riwayats and all that. Uh, so, when you come here to discuss the tafsir, uh, what source do you rely on? Because it is mentioned that tafsir of the Quran is done from the Quran itself. So, when you rely on certain ayat or passage, now that has to be understood properly, and to understand that properly, it has to be understood from something else as well, from the Quran within. So it's all intermingled. So how, what do you rely you know, on? We have, <laughs> first of all, for tafsir of the Quran, uh, we don't have more than 200 narrations from the Prophet which talks about different verses of the Quran. So we certainly cannot rely on traditions from the Prophets, because even if they are correct, if they are authentic, they are so limited in number, which do not talk about all verses of the Quran. The same thing is about the traditions from Ayyam Ali Musalam, especially the Shia Mufassirun who were actually uh, compiling traditions about the, the verses of the Quran. They were not concerned about the whole verses. They were concerned about those verses mostly which talked about or alluded to them. So again, we don't have a sort of comprehensive uh, compilation of traditions for uh, a co uh, explanation of the Quran. Now, what we can do, I, I think the best approach and the best method is uh, an amalgamation of different methods and sources. First of all, Rationally, we have to try to understand what the words mean. This is what, of course, the early exodus did as well, and all exodus do now as well. I mean, what, what is the structure of the sentence, the word, what they mean, what we understand from the apparent meaning of the verse. This is, of course, the initial thing that we do. If there's any tradition or narration about it, we investigate and we see if, of course, we can accept it or not, either rationally or by comparing it to verses of the Quran, whether we can accept. If it is acceptable, then that is a more light which is shed on, on the understanding. Then the other very, very uh, important method is to compare it with other verses of the Quran. This is what is called tafsir al-Quran bil Quran. We explain verses of the Quran by other verses of the Quran. And this method, of course, was used by our IMA very much. Uh, and then any other evidence that we can find from any source, we may bring them and put them all together and then try to uh, find a final sort of understanding to the best of our knowledge about a verse. So we put all these things together and then we try to understand a verse of the Quran. So for example, when you are the Surah Kahaf that we are doing, uh, when you are sitting down to sort of uh, work out how we are going to discuss the particular passage today, probably you may be having lots of thoughts in mind as to this ayat connects to which other ayat in the Quran and then it connects to which one and so on and so on. So eventually it may come that you, you may be having the whole of the Quran in your mind and Otherwise, how will you know that which ayat actually can probably connect with them? Well, of course, our exit nowadays is very easy. You know, there's a, there's computer search and you do these things. But in old days, I, I mean, it's amazing. The Mufassirun, both Sunni and Shia, you would see that apparently they had the whole Quran in their mind. And when they wanted to give an explanation of a verse, you see that they very easily and very thoroughly mention all the verses which were related. To, to this verse, and then try to come to a conclusion. Of course, they they got it from each other. I mean, initially, it was not a sort of uh, a complete set of verses all together uh, in one place coming from the mind of one exegete. For example, one exegete mentioned a couple of verses. Later on, when another exegete wanted to, to make the commentary, 
brought a couple of two verses in, and it has been built up. And therefore, uh, in majority of cases, what I find, because for, for this tafsir, of, of course, I go through many Sunni and Shia tafsir to see what they say. And this is very helpful. I mean, you have to see what others say about this to come to a conclusion. So in majority of the cases, what I have seen, the exegetes, both Sunni and Shi, they have not missed a verse which is related to another verse. They bring it. They bring it, they discuss it, and they say in what way it's related, what light it could shed on this one. And in this way, so this method of uh, tafsir or Quran, bil Quran, has been something which has a, a very long history. Although, of course, it was not the, 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 the sole method, which Allama Tawat Hawaii actually made it the sole method in his tafsir. He did not use any other thing, except, of course, uh, uh, syntax and grammar and etymology, such things, linguistics. However, he made it the sole method, but other exegetes, of course, didn't make this the sole method. They used the, uh, the, the opinions of the companions, the opinions of Tabi'un, their successors, and such things. And all these are helpful. I mean, their main aim is to understand what is meant by every sentence or every verse. And whatever which can help is good. But there are things which not only they do not help, they confuse, like many of these narrations. <laughs> so we have to put them aside. Thank you, uh, Any sisters? Brothers? No? Anybody? No? Thank you, Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad. Inshallah, we continue next week. Inshallah, inshallah next week. We continue with Ya'juj and Ma'juj. <laughs>